Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And today we have our friend David Rosenfeld back with us today uh, in a special uh, dog-free uh, guest house room temporarily. Um, he's going to be talking about his new book, uh, Animal Instinct, with Barbara. And we are getting signed copies. We just haven't received them quite yet. Uh, we should be getting them very soon. So for those of you watching, it's an awesome cover, isn't it? Uh, for those of you watching on Facebook, um, I will be monitoring the comments field. So if you have any questions for David, uh, complaints or grievances, um, go ahead and send them in. Uh, and mine is, when are you going to get a Greyhound before we get started? <laughs> we always have this conversation. They are not in shelters. They're not in shelters anywhere where they don't have tracks. I've yeah. never, literally never seen a Greyhound in a shelter, either in California or Maine. Well, next time you come out to Phoenix, maybe you'll have to leave with a, uh, a rescue Greyhound. I would love a Greyhound. They're gorgeous. And They're like, yeah, oh, Patrick, Patrick had one and he really loved her. Yeah. But unfortunately, she eventually, as often happens with older dogs, um, died. We may they get carry themselves one. with dignity. They really uh, do. They're yeah. great. They're beautiful dogs. I anyway. have to adjust my, my photograph. I, I, I look like it's my mug shot on zoom i can't stand this <laughs> so i'm gonna look to, i'm gonna look away from my own picture well i'm gonna disappear into the midst for a little while um okay. but i'll pop up with questions so barbara it's over to you thank you very much patrick i don't know if you can see this absolutely i'll get up really close here because i really do love the cover and as david discovered many years ago the whole secret to publishing success <laughs> is to have dogs on the cover of your books it's very classy don't you think I mean, you pick it up, you think it must be Dostoevsky or something. <laughs> well, um, what I do think is interesting is, you know, a, an off debated question. Do you write to the dogs on the cover or did the dogs on the cover match what you wrote? Do you the breed? Yeah. I write to the dogs on the cover. That's what the, I publisher, the publisher comes up with the cover before I even know what the book's going to be about. So I always write. To, I wrote one book, actually. When, when the first time I had a dog on the cover was a book called Play Dead. And it was actually gonna be the last Andy Carpenter book. It was like book six. And they, for the first time they put a dog on the cover and it sold tremendously well for, my, for me. So they decided that I should have, uh, I should write another book and I agreed and they sent me the jacket immediately and it had two dogs on the cover. So I actually, it had a Bernese and a Golden. So I actually wrote the book to the jacket. Right. I love it. Which I don't think is how Hemingway used to do it. Probably I... not. Um, we actually had a discussion, I'm trying to remember who went the other day, about writing to title. Uh, whether, um, I think it was two women authors the other day, it might have been JT Ellison and, um, and Allison Brennan, about um, one of them, I think, really likes writing to title. Um, and so writing to cover, I guess, is just an extension. So tell us, what, what do we have on the cover here in Animal Instinct? I forget, I can't see the cover. I here. forget already. I'll come closer. Um, Chihuahua? I don't remember, I honestly don't remember. You don't remember. Okay, well, neither do I, because I read it a while back. One of them looks like um, a German Shepherd. Oh, the German Shepherd is a regular in that series. Right. That's for sure. That's why it's called a K team. The German Shepherd is an ex police dog. So I, I don't even know if the if the dog in the chair is actually in the book. I don't I honestly don't remember. But, um, <laughs> well, it, it looks more but, like a Boston Terrier to me than a Chihuahua. Oh, that's right. That's right. It is. is it a Boston Terrier? Yeah. Yay. Yes, it, yes, it is. Um, the um, German Shepherd is named Simon Garfunkel. And he um, he's always in the he'll, he's in actually he's in the Andy books now as well. But he's always in the K team books. So the K team, um, I was we did an event last night with Paula Munier and Margaret Mizushima, who both have uh, K nine working dogs in their mystery series. And I I pointed out to my great embarrassment that I looked at that for I don't know how many months or years before I ever actually said the title aloud and realized that K dash nine what it what it really meant. Oh. <laughs> You know, I just looked at it, but but until I actually pronounced it as K9, I went, ah. So K team, um, I'm assuming that your K team has a sort of similar origin story. 
uh, origin story. By the way, well, the title of the next, the next K-Team book is called- No, 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 I know. Is uh, what? It's called Citizen, Citizen K-9, right? <laughs> I love it. No, I just yeah. meant why, why is it called the K-Team? Just catchy title. You know, we wanted to have this dog in it and um, he's an ex-cop and the dog is an ex-cop. So, it, and, and it's a team of, uh, his name is Corey Douglas and Laurie and Marcus from the Andy books. And they have an investigative team. So it, and, and they have a canine with them. So it's K, K team. So the K team came into play. So a variation on a theme, right? So in part, um, Andy, Andy Carpenter, whom I dearly love is um, an attorney who prefers not to work. And so he gets dragged into case after case either either by virtue of a dog or a family member or an old friend or something that where he's forced to go to work even though he doesn't want to is the k-team a spin-off in part just because it gives andy a break although he actually plays a role in this book yeah he does play a, actually a pretty big role um it, it's a spin-off because people like the secondary characters a lot and i'm doing three books a year so two of them are Andy's and one is, so we spun this off. Um, and it's told from a different perspective. It's told from this Corey Douglas's perspective. He speaks in first person rather than Andy. Um, but because it's Laurie and Marcus and all the other players are there, it's definitely a spinoff. And um, Andy has a big role in this one. Uh, yeah, he does. No, I was really impressed to see him being so active because I thought he was, you know, down at the sports bar, you know, with the guys watching TV or home on the couch. And to my amazement, here he is actually working. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I should do that. I'm still not sure if I should have um, because it blurs the line, you know, it, it you know, it, it's a totally different perspective. So it's a different book. But Andy's really in it and handles a case. So there's a lot of an there's a lot of an Andy book in this one. I don't think that your fans are going to be upset if Andy is in this book. I mean, we all know it's a spinoff. I really like the way that you know Laurie, because Laurie, after all, was a was a cop um, and a hardworking cop, and in fact, one point actually went to Wisconsin and ran a police department before she came back. So I think having her have. Um, um, a larger investigative role, not, you know, not just working Andy's cases as an investigator, but doing stuff of her own is a really good thing. Right, which is why I did it actually, but um, it, it definitely gives them more to do. And it it's, allows me to get away from Andy a little bit while keeping them in the action. So, I mean, it's there, I enjoy writing them um, more than I had enjoyed writing the thrillers that are with all different characters. I enjoy the, these people more. Um, so no, I'm, I'm actually, the first book in the series, I thought was okay. This one I'm actually really pleased with, which for oh, me, is like a, this was like a major statement for me, right? But I'm really pleased with this one. It is a major statement for me, but still, um, you know, if you're not enjoying it, then the reader's not going to enjoy it. And I thought this one was really a lot of fun. It also reminds me how useful it is to have somebody like Marcus in the cast. Yes, Marcus fills a role. Definitely. As, I as mean, otherwise we'd be really worried about people's safety. But fortunately, Marcus, who appears to be unstoppable, right. um, you know, um, he's such a he's such a useful player. He, he doesn't always have that big a role in the Andy Carpenter ones, but certainly here, where he's actually part of the team. Did you decide to make Laurie the only person who can really communicate with him? Was that a deliberate decision, or did it just kind of grow on you? You, yeah, you know me enough by now to know I don't really make deliberate decisions. They, they just happen, just came out that way. I mean, first of all, Andy can't understand him, which I, I think can be funny. And somebody has to understand him. So I chose Lori, but I, I don't, you know, I'm, I never consciously do this stuff. It just, all of a sudden it's on the page and then I go from there. Got it. Well, I know that you are, um, how do I want to say that? An author of some impulse. Definitely yeah. not, not <laughs> uh, <laughs> being kind That's here, a fair right? Way. I know. Well, That's we've known way. each other forever. We've known each other since yeah. your first book. So, you know, I've always, um, I always <laughs> find it interesting that you are so self-deprecating and yet, you know, you're incredibly productive. Three books a year. Wow. And, you know, you're a really inventive plotter. So even though you're constantly kind of 
you know, shrugging your shoulders and pushing, um, you know, questions about craft or anything else away. The truth is that you're just a natural at it. The weird thing is when it comes to plot, I, when I say I'm not very good at it, I, I actually believe it as I'm saying it. And then I write the book and then I just had the experience this week. Uh, the, the next Andy book is coming out in July and they, you know, I hand it in and then they send me to galleys. So I've just read the galleys like in the last day or two to proofread them. And the plots really seem to come together, right? And I'm always surprised by that because I do them one step at a time. And so I, I don't think of them as, as particularly cohesive, no less coherent, but by the time I'm fin finished with them and reread them, I think the plots actually, a lot of the plots are pretty good. They might be too complicated in cases, um, but I, I, no, the, I'm, I'm pleased with it. I, I'm pleased with the plot and animal instinct also. I'm raving about myself in this interview. No, I don't know if you noticed. I'm, that's my I'm role. I'm deprecating, but I'm, I'm raving about myself. <laughs> I, it's a nice change because usually it's me that's <laughs> raving about you and you spurting me. So no, I like this better. And I'm encouraged that you just read it because with any luck by July, when we talk again, you'll still remember it. But <laughs> it's always, you know, okay. kind of touch and go. Ask me about it now. <laughs> ask me about I'm, it now because it's fresh. I know, we should really talk about the July book, which of course I haven't read, but usually the deal is by the time we do one of these, David's forgotten the book and I've just read it. And so we, we move along that way. We haven't yet had the experience where David remembers the book and I haven't read it yet. So we might try that, that'd be kind of a novelty. And now I'm writing the October book. So the July book will be in my mind for another hour and a half. Right. And I've forgotten it flash away. Well, I wish that we could actually talk about the um, the plot in this book, because I think it's one of your more ingenious plots. And it's also a really alarming plot. And unfortunately, we can't do that. But I think maybe we should make a condition of people watching the July event, the second half, that you needed to have read Animal Instinct because I think it would be fun to actually talk about this book. So maybe we'll have a split event. We'll, we'll have a chat about the July book and then we'll switch to book club mode. And we'll actually talk, and, and I, will, I will keep it in mind, David, so I can lead the discussion yeah. in case you've completely forgotten. <laughs> well, if, if, if warn me if we're gonna do that and I'll have reread it by then. I will, um, but, but you know, I think you have a natural, I mean, you could have been a career criminal. I've said that to you before, because your mind seems to work in, um, you're particularly good at fraud. I don't know that I'd say you were so what? good at murder. Fraud. Yeah. You said fraud? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's my specialty. It really is, you know, you have a, you have a, a kind of uncanny bent for, for fraud, and that embraces not only the mechanics of the fraud, but the kind of people who would both perpetrate it and be sucked in by it, which are which are different things. Um, because, you know, most cases of fraud require a certain naivety or credibility on the part of the people who are being scammed or frauded, defrauded is the word. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Since you, since you talk and to every author who does this and reads read every one of these books, do any of these books not have murders in them? You mean a, a, a mystery such as yeah. we're, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, it used to be, it's it. if you go back all the way back to the golden age, you know, which in our case is probably our childhood, but no, no, before that, slightly. Um, let's go back to the 1920s and 30s and stuff. There were a lot of, of mysteries that didn't have murders in them. You know, they, they had like, you know, stolen diamonds or they had um, all kinds of criminal activities. Marjorie Allingham in particular wrote a number of books in which murder did not figure in. She had one. I was absolutely amazed that she brought it off. She had this whole menacing thing going on. And at the end, normally, if you have built up to something that is supposed to be completely terrifying, if you show it, it's a disappointment. And so most of the time authors finesse that, you know, and you don't, but she actually takes you right there to the window and you're looking at it. And I was so impressed that, that she did that, but there was no murder 
in that. And yes, you could certainly write a mystery that doesn't have a dead body in it. In fact, you know, uh, heist novels are terrific fun. I mean, think about The Sting. Have you watched Arsene Lupin? On, do you ever watch any TV? Uh, sports and news, but I've been watching some Netflix stuff, mostly documentaries. Okay, well, there's a series on, and it's a, it's an older series um, written by, I'm trying to remember the author, but anyway, it doesn't matter. It's called Arsene Lupin, L-U-P-I-N, Gentleman Thief. And they were set, they're set in Paris. And this is an, an update on Netflix. But the whole thing is about, um, about a f fraud. I mean, it's a, it starts with an art heist at the Louvre and um, a diamond heist, actually. Queen Marie Antoinette's diamond or whatever it all is. And it just goes on and on and on. But um, it's not about murder. It's really about um, ripping people off. It's about... Uh, savaging people's reputations. It's about um, a thief trying to um, use his skills to bring all of that to light and expose the bad guys. So yeah, you don't have to kill people. Just always, I always think I'm going to do it without a murder. And then it feels like the stakes aren't high enough. And I mean, like, for instance, Michael Connolly, would, has, every book he's ever written has a murder in it, right? I mean, all, yeah, well, yeah, because I mean, there's a higher level of violence in his books than there is in yours, because he doesn't have Marcus, for one thing. Right. <laughs> Marcus is there, you know. Um, but yeah, By the I don't way, to get, not to get off the track, but we mentioned, we mentioned Netflix. I want to recommend The Staircase oh, yeah? on Met Netflix. It's a documentary. It's phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And it's about a real life supposed murder and trial. And it's, it's remarkable. I'm trying to think. One of the, you know, there, there's a number of really great trial novels. I'm trying to remember if I, I think most of them do, in fact, end up with a murder. But in any case, you could make the stakes high enough, depending on whether whatever the subject, let, let's say, um, you know, if a person's entire life will be shattered by um, losing all of their all of their income or all of their assets. And what would that be? Let, you know, what if you had somebody who right. had a terminal illness or something and um, and somebody contrives to take away all of the assets and and then that person can't be cared for or whatever? I mean, it isn't an actual right. murder, the, but- the stakes, the stakes for the defendant would be high enough. I just like to, to keep the danger aspect of it going throughout feels like it requires physical violence. But. Well, you know, kidnapping is another one in which really the whole suspense is whether that whoever's kidnapped is going to survive. Um, and so you could you could write a book where, you know, that's the deal. And in fact, the dogs could be particularly useful in a book where you're now you're trying to find somebody who's been kidnapped. I mean, dogs, dogs are really good at that kind of thing. Yeah, actually a K-team book would be good for kidnapping. Andy, yeah. not so much because he has to defend somebody. But the other one, uh, okay, I think I'll go. <laughs> I think I'll go with well, that. Why not? We actually had a discussion the other night about um, a different kinds of dogs that have appeared in mystery books. For example, um, Jan Burke wrote a book uh, called Bones about a cadaver dog and how uh -huh. cadaver dogs work, which I thought was um, very powerful. Um, I, I think the, the cadaver dog was obviously um, pointing towards cadavers, murder victims. But I, but I can't remember because it's been forever since I read it, but you could presumably write some book like that where everybody was already dead. Um, and it was a question of finding them. I mean, Paula Munye, who lives in New Hampshire, but very close and writes her books are set in Vermont. I don't know if you know her, but she's not Maine, but very close. Her third book about, about the canine, a war veteran who has come home with a um, a working an army working dog and rebuilding life and so forth it turns out she said to me in real life which just amazed me that the woods in new hampshire to some degree vermont are absolutely littered with bodies it's like a dumping ground for boston and new york and all because you know you're out there in the wilderness and so um they're they're finding you know all kinds of bodies um that relate to so i mean i suppose you could you know you could create a book in which the dogs find bodies and then it's it's a cold case where you're you know working your way back to why this body is there but you don't have to have anybody dying on the page that's a good so, idea would you write it for me <laughs> you know what 
You have You're like a James just, Patterson thing. You write it and I'll mold it. I comply. There is no way to duplicate your voice. I mean, the real joy of reading your books, David, is your voice. And nobody can duplicate that. I wouldn't even begin to try to do it. You are hilarious. So write it and then I'll put my voice into it. How's that? <laughs> well, we could we could talk about a collaboration. I love that. Did you hone this wonderful voice? And I mean, I know that you were not a screenplay writer. You were really a media guy in Hollywood. But you know, have you always been a wise ass, or did it just sort of grow over time? No, I've always been a wise ass. But it, but um, I didn't write it write that way until um, I started writing screenplays, and much more so novels. You mean as much. You, Writing novels is much more freeing than screenplays. I mean, screenplays, a, a tenet of it is that something has to happen on every page to move the story along. And the novels, like, you know, I, like, I think in this book, Corey starts out talking about his fear of the ocean, right? And it's like two pages of having nothing to do with the story. So like whenever I, I come up with something, you know, every, if Andy has like a thing that bugs him or something, I, I'll, I'll do a page and a half on it. But it had nothing to do with the story, so that's what I really. That's why I really like novels better than screenplays. And uh, not only that, it's it's all you. I mean, screenplays are by their very nature collaborative, and then you know, and at the end, the actor takes over, and you can't even be sure that the actor is going to deliver all of your lines the way you wrote them. Right. Although in the in the few experiences I had where my my work was actually filmed, which was three TV movies, I was stunned by how much attention they paid to it. Now, TV movies is different because they, they shoot in 18 days, so they don't have time to fool around. But um, I mean, I, my first TV movie was called To Love, Honor, and Deceive. And the first page of it was this woman, Vanessa Marcel, runs up to the house and she's, uh, it's, it's a dream sequence. And she's afraid of something happened to her child. And there's a bicycle laying on its side in front of the house. And the wheel is slowly turning. I have no idea why I wrote that, but I, so I wrote that, right? It was like eerie. And I forgot I wrote it. And then I went down there when they filmed it, the, you know, to Charlotte, North Carolina, where they filmed it. And I get there and there's a guy laying behind a bush, pulling a string, turning the wheel. Right? I was like blown away that they actually paid attention to that. Wow. So yeah, it was actually very cool. Very cool. I can see that. You know, we I had a, a very good discussion with Will Staples, who is a tremendously successful screenwriter. He wrote the right stuff. He's written the Jack Ryan franchise. He wrote the largest selling video game or game, whatever it is ever. Really an interesting guy. He has suddenly fallen in love with writing books. And his mm -hmm. debut novel is called Animals. And um, in our discussion, he said, and I've seen this with a screenwriter I have worked with, <laughs> that his problem was that the novel the novel started out sort of like a screenplay and it was like 83 pages or something because he was so used you know to the camera and the actors and everything um filling in right. stuff and so you know he had to remember that he had to go back and actually describe things or move people around or whatever so you know it, he had to he had to fill in all the stuff that a novel does um because it you know he can't he's used to the screenplay and i've certainly talked to, to novelists who've had trouble boiling things down to a screenplay you know either way um it's it's a different experience yeah i never had the experience he had what was actually i had sort of the reverse if you if you read my books i don't have a very good visual sense at all my my ability such as it is, is more in dialogue. Um, so if you look at my books, there's very little description. I yeah. mean, it doesn't even rain in my books, right? I mean, it's like, there's nothing, right? So, and in, in movies, it was, a, it was a problem for me because you really have to be visual when you're writing a screenplay. So that's the trouble I had. Um, I was making it too dialogue heavy at the expense of the visualness in, in film. And yet, you know, in your books, David, the dialogue really paints things so vividly that, you know, if Corey's talking about the ocean, it isn't like you have to describe the ocean. Um, it, it all comes across through, through dialogue. And that, that's a really rare talent. Robert Parker was so good at dialogue. I remember when I would get a new Parker, no matter how 
tired I was, or, you know, if I was up to my eyebrows and things or whatever, I would always pick up the Parker and read it because it was just such a pleasure. And it was, his stories were great, but just following along was, was so easy. I don't know if I can explain that very well, I, but believe me, I know because I love Parker. I think yeah. in the mid eighties, I went into a bookstore and I, I wasn't a mystery fan and I picked up a Robert Parker book. And in the space of, I don't know, a week, I had read every Spencer he had ever written. I, I love Spencer. Me too. I was but, pleasantly surprised. I recently read one by, I forget the guy's name, who writes the Spencer books now. It was very good. Ace, but Ace, Ace is more, is not as, he's, he's got more other stuff besides dialogue. I think he is very good. But yeah. Bob could have pages of dialogue. You know, I mean, and the other thing Bob told me a long time ago, because we used to do a lot of events together, was that he never wasted time on words in dialogue other than said. He never had people sigh. He never had people ask. He never had people moan. You know, it was always, da -da, he said, you know, blah, blah, he said. Um, and he would put in the dialogue tags only when you needed them so you could remember who was talking. Right. But otherwise, he could have like, you know, a lot of back and forth in and there was no, no tag to I, tell I, you who it was at all. I do the same thing. I, I'll never say he moaned or he yeah. griped or whatever. Um, where I have a problem with when I should put in that he said or she said is thinking about it in terms of the audio books. And, you know, and I've never read I've never heard an audio book. But it seems to me it must be difficult for people listening to it to know who's talking when there's a back and forth going on to know who's saying it. So that's why every third sentence or so I'll put in he nodded and then spoke or, you know, he said or whatever. What that, an that's interesting why. idea. You know, um, I would assume that if the I don't listen to audiobooks, but my husband, Rob, really does. And I remember him talking about the reader for the J.K. Rowling books that what a genius this person was because he could he could adopt ad, adapt himself to every voice you know yeah. so that and i think if you had an audio reader who was able to not just read it but actually change voices and so forth I then have to listen sometime the audio reader on the andy carbonate books is is supposed to be fantastic like well, then you then you wouldn't you shouldn't even worry about this then Probably. i mean i haven't listened to one maybe i will maybe i will um that's an interesting idea. Maybe I will listen to one. I'll give you feedback. But it's possible that you're worrying about something that is actually not an I issue. Mean, I really should listen. The guy who does the Andy books is a guy named Grover Gardner. Yeah. And every year the books are nominated for best book of the year for the Audi Awards. And believe me, the, the writing is no better in audio than it is in print. So it's got to be this guy, right? So, um, but he's... Uh, he does all the, he does John Updike. He does a Robert Caro LBJ books. Like he does, he's a serious player. And it's like, he's slumming when he does the Andy books, but he, people just love him. I get emails on him all the time. You know what? He probably loves doing it. Yeah, he does. We, we, I communicate with him all the time. Every time we yeah. get him. No, I'm, I imagine that he does. I mean, because as I said, your books are really funny. And not only that, the people in them are really human and they don't, I mean, Andy does kind of, but but most of them own up to whatever it is they're doing or what they've done. You know, there's not um, there's not much in the way of def except for Andy defensiveness or you know um, an attempt to cast off blame on somebody else. Now I don't even know how you could do the dialogue with Marcus because it's got mm, you know, but um, but for the other people it'd be great. So maybe we should just give people a slight clue about what animal instinct is about. And, and in this one, um, it's really Corey. And um, if I remember right, the victim of the murder in this book is somebody that he knew when he was um, a cop. Yeah, he was a cop. He was a cop and he went to a house one night. It's like a year in the past or a year and a half in the past. And it was a domestic violence thing. And the woman was bleeding and um, she claimed she fell and the guy there who Corey took an instant dislike to said he didn't do anything and she said he didn't do anything. So there was no way Corey could intervene except to warn the guy. And that was it and he left and he, he couldn't make, he couldn't press charges, but it always bothered him. And then one day 
now he hasn't been a cop for a year and he reads in a paper that she was killed and he's sure that this guy must have done it and he blames himself for not have somehow not having done more so he gets involved with the k team to try and nail this guy but it goes way on from there in a way i'm not sure we should talk about but it goes no way on. no unfortunately this is a book where um it would it be we could spoil it in a heartbeat for people but i this is the one where i said you're your ingenious mind for criminal behavior really shines. Um, I was I was really impressed. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, it, it really is a fascinating book to read in terms of of what the what the actual plot's all about. And damn it, we can't mention that. So, um, July book is coming. Christmas book you're working on. Um, what's up with the dogs in Maine? You're over there in your guest house, away from, but. I understand you're in hiding from a large mastiff. Is this new mastiff a rescue dog? I was going to do it in the house, but it's fairly early here, and the dogs were making ridiculous amounts of noise. And we have a 185 now pound mastiff named Lucy, and she's a, a fluffy English mastiff. She's fantastic, and she came over. I'm sitting there, like 15 minutes before we're supposed to do this, and she comes over and she goes <laughs> like this and sprays slobber all over my computer over me it was a, it was a disaster right so i just couldn't take a chance so we have a like a guest apartment here so i, I i'm hiding out i'm heartbroken that this didn't happen on camera i, mean, I can't think of anything <laughs> yeah. more perfect for talking to david than of having a giant head looming over him and going yeah. mm, and spraying the screen it would have been ideal but the dogs are doing fine we're down Good. to 12 now are you really? Sure. But but yeah. you pointed out that that Maine is not certainly California in terms of the number of dogs need rescuing. But David, is the pandemic lessened the number of rescue dogs because people are more at home and have obviously been apparently it, it's dramatic. It's dramatically lessened the number of dogs that need homes. That's that's so I'm told. I mean, but Maine, do you think that? Well, do you think that? And I worry about this because we have a rescue dog. Um, I don't can't remember if you've seen her, but I mean, our, uh, we had two. And unfortunately the older dog um, died in January. He was nearly 16 and there wasn't really any way to save him. So the one we have is um, mostly Shiba Inu, but also part terrier. So she looks like a little fox. You know, she's that gorgeous russet color and she has a big plumy tail, huge eyes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so we've been trying to decide whether we should get her a puppy of her own because she's never been home alone before How old um, is she? she's probably four or five by now um she was about a year old when we got her and you know at our age I, i'm not sure we should be starting all over with a puppy anyway because you know i mean that might not be fair um to a dog to to adopt one when you yourself are elderly but in any case um it's really been hard to to find. I mean, we've done some online searches and um, there's a, I can't remember the name of it, but the American Kennel Association has kind of a dog looking group and divides it up by breeds or so forth. So I've written off to a couple of them and they're just, it isn't easy to find a dog at the moment. Yes, that's what I've been told. And a lot, but a lot of them I think are fosters. I think people came in and fostered a lot of dogs. Now, whether they'll return them or not, or they'll, they'll be what rescue people call foster failures and they'll keep them, I don't know. Well, that, but, but what worries me is that when people can get back out again and you know, um, assuming that maybe in another year or so, that's a much more likely thing, whether there will suddenly be a flood of dogs released to the market where people took them on and then don't necessarily want to to keep them kind of like the Easter bunny thing, you know, where people bring home an adorable bunny right. and it doesn't work out three months later. So I do worry somewhat about what will happen to all these pets. I would doubt that, but I, I don't know. Well, I, I hope know. I'm, I hope I'm wrong and that people will be so attached to their pets that yeah. it will so go that way, which would be excellent. So Patrick, we probably exhausted our topics here. Do you want to pop back in and see if we have any comments from the audience? There he is. Sure. Yeah. Actually, before I do that, um, David, the staircase. Mm. Um, what's your take? I think he did it. I do too. Yeah. I do too. Have yeah, you heard the Have it. you heard the the crazy owl theory? Yeah, I know. 
<laughs> and they, they barely mention that in the, in yeah. the thing. But yeah. it, so you saw it, it's great, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. Very bizarre story. Right. Yeah. I, I think, I, I, let's put it this way. I would vote, I have voted to acquit, but I think he did it. Yeah. You know, once we heard what happened with the, with the guy at the end, the, the scientist, I would have voted to acquit, but I think he did it. Talk about all these knucklehead uh, witnesses reenacting the scene and all that kind of right. stuff. It's pretty yeah, funny. It's amazing. It's amazing. Oh, boy. Um, let's see here. Okay, yeah, Heidi. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the fans are just saying how much they love your, your books, and they aren't really asking a lot of specific questions. But Heidi says, I, I always get the hardcover book and the audio book, as I like to read, read it as well as have it read to me. Um, where does your sense of humor come from? Were your were your parents funny? Um, uh, no, <laughs> my father was <laughs> my father was funny in a corny way. Um, it was very different humor. I, I don't think so. I mean, our our house was funny, and growing up there was I mean it was a fantastic house to grow up in. I mean it was like. Um, I think I wrote in a bio once that it, it made like Ozzy and Harriet look dark and edgy. You know, that's that's what a great house it was to grow up in. Um, but no, I wouldn't say my parents are funny and um, I have no idea where I got my sense of humor. Um, excuse me, Karen says, uh, would your family say that you are a lot like Andy? Um, I, I think certainly my perspective on life and my sense of humor and stuff, yes. And, and in fact, I am Andy. Um, you know, if like I've told this before, but uh, one year I wrote Dog Tripping, which is a, a nonfiction story of our story and rescue and our trip from California to Maine. And it's told in my voice, first person. And I wrote it this back to back with an Andy book, which is told in Andy's voice first person. And I was really surprised to find that it was the exact same voice. I mean, I, I didn't even realize it until I wrote the books back to back, um, how identical my voice was to Andy. Now, you know, my Andy doesn't have too many obvious flaws and my family would see, certainly see many of mine, but in terms of voice, certainly, and perspective on life, uh, um, definitely, Andy. Does that make it easier for you? Probably does. It's much it more natural. It, much it makes yeah. it much easier. Uh, the hardest thing it, I ever had to write was when I wrote my first uh, standalone thriller with all different characters. Um, because and it was third person. That was like real writing compared to what I how I see the Andy books. I see the Andy books just me talking. Um, so. Yeah, and to be able to do it in Andy's voice makes it much easier for me, much easier. David, I meant to ask you in, in this whole discussion, um, are you abandoning the standalone thrillers in favor of the KT? Yes, for the moment anyway. Because I thought some of them were, were extremely well done, very well, well plotted. I always loved the guy that did the reverse commute from New York to New Jersey. Um, and which book was that? Was that hard I don't remember, but I just loved it. Um, I'm pretty proud of those books. I thought they were okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, I thought they were, you know, they all stood on their own and, you know, except for two of them, I didn't like very much looking back, but the others I really liked. Um, but, you know, people read them and say, where's Tara? You know, I mean, it's like everybody now, I'm it's like I'm typecast as Andy and funny and dogs and stuff. So I just like gave into it. And uh, so, yeah, so, and, and I'm doing three books a year two Andes and, um, and one K team. And this is now the third year that's happening. And, you know, I just signed on to do three books a year for the next two years. So, yeah. And I'm that's not- That's a self-inflicted punishment. Working. Now, listen, you can't expect a lot of sympathy from that. Nobody's forcing you to write three books a year. You no, but I'm saying I can't, fit, I can't fit in a fourth, uh, you know, thriller. I mean, I just can't. Right, now I understand that, but obviously you're really there is football doing season. It. There is football season also, right? So I can't write four months a year. So it's not so easy. Um, okay, so I do have some questions coming in finally. Uh, let's see here. 
where where in Maine do you live? I live in an area called Mid Coast. We're not far from a town called Demerascata. Right. And it's about an hour and 15 minutes north of Portland along the coast, near the coast. It's beautiful up here. Uh, let's see, Patty asks, are there any plans for Lori and Andy to have a child of their own? I know they adopted Ricky. Will they give Ricky a brother or sister? No, they won't. <laughs> but I can't break a piece of news now that actually, uh, the publisher didn't even know this because I just wrote it two days ago. Edna is getting married. No, really? She's getting married in, in the October book. To anybody we've seen well, before? My editor hates the idea. What? To anyone no, we've seen before? No, no. Nobody. Edna nobody getting knows. married. Astonishing. Edna, yeah. Yeah. I have number, a, a number of people that are disappointed. They want to see the dogs. Um, yeah. Well, maybe next time. Um, and then Catherine's weighing in on the staircase. She she says that she thinks the owl did it, and uh, she may be right. You know, uh, it's a crazy theory, but um, yeah, and people in, in retrospect have taken it seriously. The great thing about for for everybody else who hasn't seen it, the great thing about the staircase, it's a real life murder that took place. Not, I'm sorry, it's a death that happened in North Carolina, and a guy was charged with the murder, but from the first moment he thought this was. 2002, is that right? Somewhere, Somewhere around there. Yeah. The yep. first moment, he, he didn't trust the legal system in Durham, North Carolina to give him a fair shake. So he invited a, a documentary camera crew in to film everything. His conversations with his lawyer, even the prosecution let them film. So you really see it from the inside. And it's also a fascinating case. So it, it's, it's very- well, And the plot thickens because apparently the the, the uh, documentary filmmaker fell in love with the guy. Did you hear that? No. Um, there's some intrigue above and beyond the documentary. Oh no, maybe, I didn't hear that. Maybe somebody knows more, but oh. sorry, sorry to talk so much about this show. But <laughs> well, you guys have ruined it now. <laughs> well, anybody who wants have, to watch we it, a, we've been careful not to ruin it. It's really, really interesting. Oh, bad right. for the poor daughters. Anyway. Um, yeah. What uh, Jody says, what authors does, does David like to read? Uh, I don't read much fiction because then I start to like imitate the other authors, right? Um, so, but, but in terms of fiction, I read Michael Connell. There, there's two authors that I'll stop writing a book to read the day their book comes out. And one is Michael Connolly and the other is Lee Child. Um, and formerly and, Robert Parker. I'm sorry, and from, yeah, certainly Robert Parker. Um, and now I'll start, I'm gonna start to read this, the, the ones, Ace, is that his name? Ace Atkins has written the Spencers and he's a real, um, a real lover and student of the whole Parker over and Spencer in particular. What I like about him, David, because I mean, I've done all, all of his Spencer books with him. So we've had a lot of great conversations um, is that he has moved Spencer forward in a in a way that does not feel unnatural, but he hasn't let him, you know, calcify in um, in time. And so Absolutely. there are some small change. And the other thing I found out, you probably knew this all along. Pearl, the Wonder Dog, you know, the Spencer yeah. dog. I yeah. for some reason I always thought it was going to be. A, I thought it was a golden, but it turns out to be what a German short-haired. Yeah. Yeah. picture or something i just i mean i can't believe it all these years i just assumed it was a golden but and this Let is like that. pearl number three that there's a puppy now in the new one because the the older pearl has died so ace has taken that into account and in the most recent one the the 2020 spencer then pearl is a puppy that's the one i read i think the, are the mike lubicus uh, books good the Parker, Mike Lubin. I books. really liked his first Sonny book a lot. Yeah, because Sonny is kind of the overlooked character. Um, right. And Reese, I thought that Reed Coleman did an interesting job with Jesse. Um, but now Mike is writing Sonny and Jesse, which almost inevitably means that they're, they'll merge, you know? I mean, because there was always kind of a hint of that anyway, you know, um, in the Parker. But I thought that his first Mike Lupica's first Sonny Randall was really good. 
I yeah. liked it a lot. Right. And I'll be doing a conversation with him in May for the third one. And then um, Ace, I guess July, Patrick, it's you and Ace on Quinn, right? It's it's the, not Spencer, it's the other series. Right. In July. But we're lucky that the Parker franchise was really a part of our life. So it's still a part of our life with right. the with the new authors and um and i'm i'm very glad to be able to keep it going because i just thought bob i mean not every book was spectacular but his whole body of work is just so Absolutely. impressive yep. you know and and as i say it was like comfort reading you know no matter how badly i felt or how annoyed i might have been or sad or whatever it is you could pick up a spencer and bang you know there you were right by book 15 i got to the point where i was skimming past the the Susan conversations. They all felt the same to me, right? Every time, you know, but other than that, it's, uh, he's great. He's great. Well, Ace has, has, I think, improved upon the Spencer-Susan relationship. Yeah. I really do. So, you know, I think you'll enjoy them. Uh, but go go back to the first one that Ace wrote and move forward. Don't, don't go the other direction. Okay. Okay. So I do have a few more questions and there, there are several people asking about uh, about TV and movies and things like that. Um, uh, Heidi asks, have you ever considered a TV series of, of Andy? Um, and who do you think would be a good choice to play Andy? Um, I'd love a TV series. It's not up to me to consider it. I wrote a pilot <laughs> once and, and actually, and it got pretty close, yeah. but it didn't get made. Um, I don't I have no idea on the who should play. I mean, my, when I was in movie marketing, my job was to know actors and you know actresses and know everybody and and now that i'm out of it i'm like a complete dinosaur i don't know anybody i mean if people say to me who should play andy i'm thinking peter falk would be good you know so i have no idea mitchum um, i yeah exactly i do know at the time that i wrote the pilot they were talking about noah wiley and oliver platt or something platt hmm. I don't know. I don't, I don't. I know nobody. I mean, I you know I. I don't uh, know there, any actors. There's a good comment here from Wanda. She says, "Edna is too lazy to get married." Well, but she's she keeps her job because she feels she has a lot of vacation time accrued, so she's going to travel a lot with her new husband. But she's still going to work for Andy. <laughs> uh, let's see, Kim. She says, "I love all the wonderful characters." Uh, some of my favorites were the senior citizen computer hackers seen in earlier yeah. Andy Carpenter books. Will they yeah. ever be back? Yeah, they're going to be back in the book I'm, I'm going to write now. Um, yeah, those they were terrific. Uh, I really liked them. I actually forgot had forgotten all about them. And um, they're coming back in, in the um, October book. Okay, let's see here. TV, TV. Um, I think you've actually answered all these questions. Okay, as Steve says, a little while ago, you mentioned that two of the books you didn't really like. And he says, uh, which two and why? Yeah, there. Um, actually, it's more one. The first book, I, the first standalone I wrote was called Don't Tell a Soul. And it's okay, right? I, I, don't, I, I went too far in saying I didn't like it. I think it's okay. The second one is called Down to the Wire. And I don't like that one. I think it's, it's unoriginal and derivative. And I just, I, looking back, I don't like it. Um, I don't think it's awful, but I don't like it. The amazing thing is to me, I get emails all the time from people saying how much they really liked it. And it sort of makes me self-conscious, like I should reply that, you know, <laughs> I don't know why it's a piece of garbage, right? But I don't. Um, so it's those two. Um, after that, On Borrowed Time, Heart of a Killer, Airtight, um, the blackout books, I, I really like them. I mean, you know, I, I, I made a bunch of stupid mistakes with them on occasion, like in Airtight, I wrote that they found the killer lying face down on his back, right? But- The uh, copy editor failed you, David. I'm kidding. <laughs> but, uh, but I like those books. So yeah, it, overall the standalones I really am pleased with, but um, the first two, I'm not sure I'd recommend them. Certainly not down to the wire. Uh, Maggie asks, would you ever consider writing a book about Marcus's backstory? Um, my agent once asked me if I'd write a book with Marcus as the lead character. And I just, 
you know, he could have some backstory in a book, but he, he can't be the central character. There's just not enough of him there. I'm forever giving him like weird idiosyncrasies. Like um, he likes classical music and uh, Andy and, and he go to Vegas on a case and Andy's shocked because he walks around a hotel and everybody says, hello, Mr. Clark, <laughs> like, like Marcus must always go to Vegas. You know, I, I, so I throw Marcus-isms like that in. Um, he has a wife who calls him my little Marky. Um, but no, I can't. Uh, I, I guess I could do one with, his, with some backstory, but I can't do it with him as the lead character. It's just not I think you have to talk for one thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I just can't pull that off. Now, just kind of going back a ways, um, Am I correct? I've heard you talk about this before, but you know about what a uh, kind of a transformative experience um, having Tara was. Um, were you a dog person your entire life, or was that something that came with that dog and that special bond that you had with her? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was a dog person only to the degree that we always had a dog, and I liked dogs, but I was not a dog lunatic by any means. Um, and Tara wasn't my dog. Tara was Debbie's dog when we met. And I actually only knew Tara for six months uh, or like eight, mo eight months, three of which she had cancer. Um, and that period, that the whole period, but especially the period of the three months was that was what was, was the transformative experience. Um, but even then, when she died, I was ready to get another dog and Debbie wasn't. Um, so we volunteered in a ship. And it was the volunteering in a shelter and rescuing dogs from there that turned me into a dog lunatic. I mean, Debbie was always a dog lunatic, but it turned me into one. Um, so, I mean, because I, I think had we not volunteered in a shelter, we, we would have gone out and gotten another golden and that would have been fine for me. So it was, it was the shelter experience and how horrible it is in LA and stuff that really, you know, set me on this descent into lunacy. Were there, are there any breed, and we talked about greyhounds, but are there any other breeds of dogs that you have never had that you would like to have? Um, there's certainly dogs I've never had. You know, we, we've never had a Vizsla. You know, we've never had a Poodle. Um, and we've never had small dogs. You know, I, I had a Maltese at one point in my life, but um, we never have, you know, small dogs would be like lunch in our house. I mean, we couldn't have a, you know, a really small dog. I mean, we have one dog that right now that we consider really small and he's 55 pounds. I remember once you described, I think this is back at your, at your peak of, uh, of, of dogs where you said they were lying around like a, like a civil war battlefield or something like that. Right. right. That because they, they're, all, they're old. So they sleep most of the day. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, I think I know the answer to this question. Paula asks, do you write from an outline or, or do you kind of wing it? Just wing it. Yeah. I, I don't know. Three pages ahead. Um, so no, totally. It gives new meaning to wing it. I, I really have no idea what's going to happen next. Let's see. Do you have, I know you've written, has it been three, there was Lessons from Tara, there was Dog Tripping. That's it, there's those two. Just just those two. Any any ideas for a, a third nonfiction? No, memoir? they talked to me about writing one, but I, I, I've like ran out of dog stuff. You know, I ran out of it and near it, near the end of Lessons from Tara. Um, but no, it, it's everything I know about dogs, which is not that much actually. Oh, um, there she is. There she is. Oh, hi. oh man. She is just the cutest thing. This is Nala and she's um, 22, 22 pounds. And she is Shiba Inu. She's a rescue dog from Los Angeles. I'm sure I told you this, David, that it turned out that the purse-sized dogs in Phoenix are sent to Los Angeles and the dogs bigger than 20 pounds in Los Angeles are sent to Phoenix, oh, which I find completely fascinating. But in any case, um, she's our rescue puppy and she's, she needs a haircut because hold your face up. She needs to look like a <laughs> fox, <laughs> but, but she's been trimmed really badly. So she doesn't have quite that, she's you a know, dog same look. She's but for anybody, anybody who's a dog lover who wanted a little glimpse of a dog, 
Let me Did see if I can. Or five years old, you said? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Oh, and if I could. Oh, quit. If I could get her to. She has the most fabulous tail. Um, it's all plumy and wavy, but I can't get her up high enough to. Oh, show it to you. There it is. It looks like it's just hanging down there, but she's so funny. When she runs around, like out in the yard, uh -huh. uh, you can see this tail just waving in the breeze. And uh, as she goes through the shrubbery and so forth, she's always on the hunt for rabbits. She's never caught one. And our fondest hope is she never will because we, she wouldn't have any idea what to do with it if she got it. But we see her streaky log with this tail pluming in the breeze and her little ears up. So our, cute. New, our new fee uh, a couple of weeks ago brought in a frozen dead bird in his mouth. I thought I was going to have a stroke. Yeah, I thought I, we'd yeah. have to move. We'd have to move like to a biosphere somewhere because that just can't happen. But it's, no, that it's, would be ugly. We had an owl. I mean, Arizona's, you know, red and tooth and claw. We had an owl that lived on the street light down at the end of the street, this huge owl. And we used to have a lot more bunnies, but we also had a whole flock of um those little budgies that used to stand on our library window and knock on it in the morning and so forth. And the owl decimated all of that. Yeah. And then when it had finished, it, it went away. I mean, they are real predators. Owls kill rabbits? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And, and small birds, as it all happens. Anyway, um, what did I miss? Is there any other question that anybody <laughs> wanted? No, there's some good stuff. Um, Wanda, she, she's bringing up something I've been meaning to ask you. It's about the, uh, she says, what brand of dog food do you use? And does Chewy know your address? <laughs> you must we spend a fortune, fortune sure. on dog food. Science diet and, um, well, Chewy certainly knows our address for things like um, pill pockets and tick medicine. We don't get uh, dog food from them because they arrive in, in boxes. And so, you, you know, we order so much of it that we wind up having a garage filled with boxes. So, so no, we, we, plus it's, it's a real hassle to have somebody come to our house. So no, we don't, um, Chewy does deliver dog food, but they do deliver treats and um, uh, pill pockets and stuff like that. So do you have a truck that you take down to the, wherever it is you get your dog food and haul it home? No, in the car. I mean, we buy like, six or seven 40 pound bags at a time. So mm. it, fit, it fits in a car. Are you the one that's schlepping those big bags? Actually, lately Debbie's been doing it. Um, Cause she goes, she has to go somewhere that's right near the this store that we get it at. So lately she's been doing it. Uh, let's see, maybe just a couple of, couple more here. Um, Patty says um, in the earlier book, Sam would always sing slash talk the um, conversation with you. He doesn't do that anymore. Did you get tired of that? No, it, it just, I'll try not to make this too long. There were two reasons I stopped. The lesser reason was that I'm like a dinosaur when it comes to music. And I don't know any current music and I'm having Andy, who's probably in his thirties, you know, song talking West Side Story. So it's just like, it just doesn't fly in. Right? Doing some Mel Torme or. Yeah, but more importantly, um, I got sued once. Carol King's attorney because uh, I use songs from a what I thought was a James Taylor song. I use lines in the book and I wasn't I didn't have permission. So I got sued for ten thousand dollars. So what happened was I, I called a friend of mine who was a lawyer in a music business and he said, I don't have a leg to stand on and I should count I should counter offer. So I offered five thousand. And the lawyer said, there's no way it'll go for five thousand, but they'll get back to me. And my agent in the meantime, who was on these emails, wrote to the lawyer and included a video that dogs uh, that my publisher had shot of me in the house with 35 dogs and rescue and so on and berated the lawyer how could you take money from this guy when every dime he makes goes to dog rescue right so it took two months so so i had made the five thousand counter offer and then carol king's attorney countered back one thousand and they would donate it back to us for dog rescue Oh, and, and that's what they did. So it's really cool story, right? I mean, it, it, what what they did, um, but that's but but the net result is between my not knowing current music and not wanting to have to go through the process if I could even of getting 
permissions for all these songs, um, that's why I stopped doing it. I, I really re stopped doing it reluctantly because it was pretty funny. That's pretty solid of Carol King, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I mean, I assume uh, she got to her. I don't know, but I, I assume. Sounds like it did. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, uh, Paula Mounier, who we just did the event with last oh. night, uh, she's tuning in and she says, David, you set, a, you set a very high bar for the rest of us, writing about dogs with your golden rescues. You're my hero. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. <laughs> Yeah, you, know, awesome. you have a low bar for heroes, so I can tell you that. But thank oh, you. Oh, stop that, David! For heaven's sake. Have you ever owned? A, have you ever owned a rough collie like Lassie? Uh, no, I don't think so. We had a, a mix that looked like that. Um, that's a that was a story where I'll try and tell this one fast. But I went to a, a shelter in L.A. one day, this horrible shelter, and the shelter worker, who I had never spoken to, comes over to me. She's crying. And she tells me about a dog that came in with a broken, a badly broken leg. Aww. And she, it was going to be put down and she kept moving it from cage to cage. So the people who run the shelter would think that it was a different dog. And then finally she couldn't do it anymore. And she put it in a vet's office and she didn't have the money and the vet wouldn't set her leg without the money. So she was crying and asking us if we would take the dog. And we did. And her name was Annie. And for the first six or eight weeks, she couldn't be adopted out because her leg had a heel for after the surgery. So she stayed at our house. She was a young dog, like a year and a half. So she wasn't appropriate for us. Um, but she became so attached to us that we kept her. And she was fantastic. We had her for like 12 years. Um, and she was one of maybe three dogs that we've ever had out of hundreds that preferred me to Debbie. All right. And what, another one, by the way, is that Mastiff who slobbered on my computer this morning, a uh, while ago. Um, well, when, we, when we get to July, David, I think that the Mastiff should be a part of our program. You could just put plastic over your computer. Come on. It wouldn't be that hard. She's an amazing dog. We got her, and after having her like a month, she became deathly ill. And she had a hole in her abdomen that the stuff leaked out of her abdomen and it caused sepsis. And they thought she was going to die. And they did two major surgeries and saved her. And she's been fine ever since. She, it's remarkable. She's, That's wonderful. I'm so glad that they were able to do that. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's, as always, an absolute joy to talk to you. It's so My much pleasure. fun because there's no structure whatsoever to our conversations. We just <laughs> gotta wing it. Um, but it really is fun. David's been part of our life for a very long time. And I know many of you have... Um, been to the poison pen to meet him and or followed us along here. So thanks to Zoom, he's in Maine and we're in Scottsdale, but we're still able to do this. Um, just as last night, Margaret Misushima was in Colorado and Paula Mounier was in at home in New Hampshire. And we were able to get together. So it is kind of magical technology. We just need to expand it to include dogs. We'll have to figure that out. Anyway, um, we do have autographed copies of Animal Instinct heading our way. I remind you, um, it will read the same without the signature, but why not have the signature for the same price is the way I look at it, right? We still and, have some of the last Andy Carpenter. Oh, we do. We still that's have some copies copy. of Muscle that are autographed, yeah. and that's such a great photo, and I love Isn't the that leash that the dog is. Yeah, that's really, really fun. So anyway, David, thanks for your time, and let me wish everybody a wonderful weekend. If you're celebrating any of the religious holidays this weekend, then Muscle Tov or whatever we want to say. Um, enjoy. Oh, good night. Thanks. So long, guys. Thank good you. Night.